Johnny Catalano here. Uh, tonight we had a true treat for the Halloween season. We had John A. Russo, the co-creator of Night of the Living Dead, who wrote the film with George A. Romero back in 1967. It came out in 1968. It's an iconic film. Uh, I think it's one of the greatest films ever made, not just horror films ever made, greatest films ever made for any independent filmmaker like myself or anyone who's interested in independent filmmaking. This is, this is the gold standard. This is, you know, a film that so all of us should look up to, should aspire to a film that children are watching, uh, 10 year olds, 50 year olds, 20 year olds, myself, you know, it's, it doesn't matter. It's just such a timeless classic. So it was just a pleasure to talk to John and uh, I couldn't think of a better way to spend my Halloween weekend, so. Mr. John A. Russo. Actually, I came up with the idea of doing a horror film. And as soon as we bought a 35 millimeter camera from the lab, and we bought this camera for $3,500, and it, it was a, it was a, it, it, nowadays cameras are self blimps which means that Built into the camera is soundproofing that keeps the sound of the camera gears inside. But in those days, the camera was a little wee thing and it was housed in an 80 pound blimp. And it all, a blimp was just this huge housing that had padding inside. And, and the sole purpose of it was to keep the noise of the camera gears off of lip sync tapes or whatever kind of take you were shooting. It was very awkward, it was very heavy. Most Hollywood movies were shot with that kind of camera, 35 millimeter Airflex blimp. And that's why early Hollywood movies didn't have a great deal of creativity in terms of camera angles and so on because you couldn't handhold that thing. And the, the tripod itself was a mammoth thing that weighed a ton. So, um, but we bought this camera and I said, well, okay, all of our editing gear and mixing gear and dubbing gear, everything we had at that point was 16 millimeter. And uh, uh, what if we get a group of us together, say 10 of us, the five of us at our company, the late image, and then five close friends and associates, and we each kick in $600, we'd have $6,000 and maybe we could shoot some kind of movie in 35 millimeter black and white and work printed down to 16 millimeter so we could do all our editing and mixing and maybe we could sell off of that. Well, I was with George Romero and Richard Ritchie and we were drinking beer and eating grilled provolone sandwiches at a little <laughs> restaurant around the corner from our studio. And George says, we're gonna make a movie, bang, he slams his hand on the tables and the bottles and ashtrays went flying and all the people in there staring at us. And because George got excited any time that there was any prospect of doing anything in the way of making movies. And Richard was very spacey and he took a drag of his cigarette and blew out a chorus of smoke rings and he said, you guys are crazy. <laughs> well, I said, well, do you want in or do you want out? And he blew another chorus of smoke rings and he said, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> so we finished out on our lunches and we went back to the studio and Russ Strider, would, we, we told the idea to Russ and Russ said, I'm in. And Gary Strider said, I'm in. And Vince Servinsky said, I'm in. We only had five people basically working there. And plus Larry Anderson, who never really, never really was on the same wave like this, the rest of us. And he said, I think we should take that $6,000 and we should make a 60 second TV spot that's a real mother. And what he thought he meant was that we should just do a superb TV spot that could get us all the New York business that we weren't getting. 
But none of us wanted to do that. We all wanted to be feature filmmakers. Eventually, Larry left the company and wasn't part of Night of the Living Dead. So then Russ said, well, let me go in the office and do some figures. After a little bit, he came up and he said, I got bad news. He said, we can't do it for 6,000. It's going to close. It's going to cost close to 12,000. Well, George always just went totally in the dumps any time there was an obstacle. And so he was just sick. And <laughs> he said, no, we can't afford to do it because even if we make the movie, there will be no money left over for any of us to make a profit. And my uncle, Udell, who was a, he had a, he, he was a wealthy doctor that had a clinic in New York. And he said, Udell will never go along with it and blah, blah, blah. So I thought for a little bit and I said, okay, well, the first six people that come in, or the first 10 people will get six shares of stock for their 600 bucks and then we're the ones that are going to make the movie or act in the movie or whatever so then the next 10 people will get only two shares for their for their 600 bucks so then george felt better that's basically how we set it up so george and i were the two writers in the group and we we toyed around with doing some kind of side fiction movie we even had a it was almost E.T. before there was E.T. because we came up with this idea about teenagers from outer space and they're catting around the universe in their little hot rod flying saucer and they land on the earth and they befriend these earth kids and then the earth kids have these extraterrestrial powers and they start playing pranks on the sheriff and the townspeople and so on. And we pretty quickly found out we couldn't afford to do that. So we better back, we better back step a few paces and go back to thinking of a horror film. And I said to George, well, whatever we do ought to start in a cemetery, because people find cemeteries spooky. And even if it's having Costello and me Dracula, for example, you see the candles moving over the coffin and Lou Costello getting scared and Bud Abbott being unaware of what's going on and so on. And it's funny, but it's scary at the same time. So I started writing a thing that started in a cemetery. And it was, you see a ghoul in a cemetery, but it turns out to be a kid in a ghoul mask because it's Halloween. But the, these, these four or five kids have stolen a case of beer and they're hiding it in the cemetery and they get caught. And the, and the leading kid gets grounded and he runs away from home and he's running through the woods and he crack, he steps through a pane of glass and under that pane of glass is a rotting corpse. And as he falls with his bleeding leg, he catches a glimpse of other panes of glass and other rotting corpses. So there's a whole field full of rotting corpses under glass. And my idea was that, okay, we can't afford to show saucer landings or any of that. We don't have enough money. But what if the aliens are already here and they like human flesh? And they like to have the flesh a little bit rotted. Like in the Middle Ages, when they shot a goose, they would hang a, they would hang the carcass up to rot for a few days before they cooked it. I guess that tenderized it. So anyway, I'm working on that. And then George came in, and he had written 20 or 30 pages of a, of a thing that started with a brother and a sister visiting their father's grave, and then they get attacked and the brother gets his head smashed against a tombstone, and the girl gets chased by, by whoever. And I read it, and I said, you know, George, this has all the right suspense and twists and turns, but who's chasing this girl? You never say. And he said, I don't know. And I said, well, seems to me it could be dead people. He said, well, that's good. <laughs> I said, you know, dead people always chase 
beautiful women. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, but what are they after? You don't say that either. They don't bite, they don't claw, what? You know, he said, I don't know. And I said, why don't we use my flesh eating idea? So he said, that's good. So that's how, that's how I became dead people after human flesh. And, and, and I thought, well, George got tied up with some kind of commercial projects and industrial film or TV spot or whatever. And I figured if we don't shoot this summer, we may never shoot our first feature film. So uh, I just took over the script reading, writing duties and I, I rewrote what he wrote and put it in the screenplay format. And, and then I worked the whole second half of the script myself. And, and George wasn't committing, he wasn't contributing ideas, and I didn't know why. But nevertheless, I would, you know, take charge of the, we had a couple of script <coughs> meetings, and nobody was saying anything but me. And I, I would say things, well, well, you know, okay, so the mood, so there has to be an escape attempt because of, they have to get out of there, and if they don't, the, the movie's over, so but the escape attempt has to fail because if it succeeds, then again the movie's over. So we have uh, we have this this we have this uh, young couple, and we have the girl who goes to catatonic, and we have uh, Ben, our hero, and the wounded girl in the basement, and then we have the dumb. The dumbass blowhard in the basement, Trump. I, I mean, Cooper. I never could resist saying that. He's then, my favorite, though. He's my favorite. Harry <laughs> Cooper. <laughs> so, then, all right, you know, in any piece of writing, and I say this in my screenwriting classes, and use Night of the Living Dead as an example because everybody knows it and so everybody can learn from it, you know. Night of the Living Dead is, is, is like stagecoach with zombies instead of Indians. And when he asked, like Ray Kroc, for example, when he would give lectures about McDonald's, he would say to college students or whoever, what, what's, what's McDonald's business? And people would say hamburgers, cheeseburgers. Nope, it's real estate. <laughs> McDonald's owns every every piece of property where there's a McDonald's franchise all over the world. So, what's Night of the Living Dead about? It's not about zombies. And Stagecoach isn't about Indians. It's about the plight of human existence. So that's what Night of the Living Dead is all about. In Stagecoach, you have you have the gunslinger, John Wayne, and you have the prostitute that he's in love with. You have uh, the, the, the alcoholic doctor who's, who's going to be called upon to use his talents and his specialty and overcome his alcoholism to do that. And in my own living dead, like I said, you have the young couple, empathetic young couple, you have, you have the catatonic girl, you have the hero man and so on, and the Cooper family with their problems in the basement and the Gulbitten girl, and are they going to pull together and survive or are their differences gonna destroy them? That's the whole issue. So horror then and now is usually the hero wins, right? Um, and that seems to be a, a big theme. Why did you choose to end on such a sour note? Why isn't there like a standard hero? Exactly. Well, you know, in any good piece of writing or art or uh, fiction or whatever, once you establish the character of the people, then they, you can't blow it. They have to behave in character, you know? They have to be true to themselves. If, if a character is going to make a drastic change in his attitudes or his beliefs or his, or his behavior, then there has to be some cathartic episode that changes that character, causes him to see things in a new light. In Night of the Living Dead, the movie, 
The story takes place in about 18 hours, you know, and there's not really much room for people to have this kind of catharsis. They're going to behave true to themselves. Ben, true enough, is a hero in most ways of looking at it, but he is so confident in himself and his ability to manage the situation that he's not, he's kind of rigid too, you know? And as far as Hardman, Carl Hardman, the Harry Cooper character in the basement, he's bent on one thing. A lot of people say, well, he was right in the end. Maybe they would have all survived if they were under the basement. We don't really know that for sure. I mean, if they were in the basement, the point is made, they wouldn't even know if somebody was, if the posse came and was going to rescue them, they might not even be aware of that. They might get bypassed. You know, I'm speculating out loud myself because I, I don't know. You know? <clears throat> and we leave, just like in real life, we leave a lot of those issues unanswered. But what we don't do is we don't, we don't blow it. We don't, we were very conscious about making everything believable and enabling people to spend, suspend disbelief and believe in our story without saying, well, that's stupid. Why would they do that? You know, like the commercials that are on television right now where, you know, Geico, you know, if you're in a if you're in a horror movie, you make bad choices. That's just what you do. <laughs> you know, I mean, and we had to wrestle with those issues too. Would 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 people believe that that some of the people in this house would want to stay in the basement? Would people believe that some of them would want to defend the upstairs or have a better view of what was going on around them? And furthermore, I mean, you can even think, well, if Ben could fight his way back to the house after the pumps explode, then why the hell couldn't they all fight their way out of there? You know, so, th so there has to be some, uh, you, you don't know if, if they're all just so scared that they wouldn't do that. You don't know how many of them, you know, there has to be certain, certain um, liberties taken with the idea or else you just don't have a movie and it just all collapses. But I think the longevity of this movie and the fact that it'll probably go on forever <laughs> is testimony to the fact that we probably made most of the right choices. <laughs> and that in itself is unusual. You know, Absolutely. most projects, there's a lot of backstabbing, there's a lot of quibbling and uh, most of the projects I've been involved with or ever heard of, there's always some dissension among the cast, the crew, the director, and so on. In the case of Night of the Living Dead, once we got rolling, we were all solidly behind George Romero as the director, and he did a great job. When I sit there and watch parts of the movie now, I'm again impressed with what a great job that George did under extreme duress, because we have no money. And, you know, we, we were, we, I mean, it was extreme to us, but George, and then the editing job that George did and the choice, you know, we, we wanted, we desperately wanted original music and we couldn't afford it. And then Carl Hardman had this Capital Pie Q library that, that, that they were agents for, and we didn't want to use cam music, but there it was. And George was excellent in choosing the right pieces of music and making them work. Yeah, I, I think the music really stands the test of time in a lot of ways. And I think it's a good, you know, moment to give, you know, rest in peace, George A. Romero, who, who you know, uh, we lost in 2017. So very much a legend of, of a filmmaker. Um, George was. Um, Sometimes say he was a genius with the camera. It was almost like the camera was part of him, you know. And I learned a lot from George. I became a very good cameraman and editor, and so on. If I say so myself, but I learned, I learned from George. But then again, the group of us, we had an amazingly talented group of people, 
and everybody gave their all. And by the time we made Night of the Living Dead, we had walls covered with awards for our commercial work, and we had done experimental films and all kinds of things that people liked. And so we, you know, every movie from the lowest TV spot on up has to be cast, costume, propped. Locations have to be filmed. It has to be, it has to be scored, you know, and it has to go out there and compete with the best that's on the air. It can't be rejected by the client or by the public. And so we, we were used to doing that. And nobody needed to be told, in our immediate group, nobody needed to be told what to do. We, were, we could wear many hats and wear them well. And we could depend on each other, but nobody was going to drop the ball. And, and it was going to get done. So, you, you, you know, you're talking about a major, what turned out to be a major motion picture. It was made, basically. There were only five of us that were, were the real filmmakers. Hardman and Eastman weren't filmmakers at that point, but they were, they were good actors and they were good production people, and they, they, they contributed enormously to the success of that movie. I'll hear you now. <laughs> a question for you. After uh, Night of the Living Dead, I know that you and George uh, had legal uh, a legal thing where you assumed the rights to the word living dead, and he got the rights to the word dead. Was that in a way, or was that done so that way you two can both do whatever you wanted creatively since you were going in different directions or can you explain what the thought was behind it? Image 10 Inc., the company we formed to do the movie, we called it Image 10 Inc. because our, our, our basic company was the latent image and then in the case of Image 10, we were gonna have the 10 basic people. So we called it <coughs> Image 10 Inc. And we were, we wanted to be able to promise anybody to put their money in that if the movie made money, we weren't going to put it into some project they didn't approve of. We wanted them to know that if it made money, that money would be distributed. So Image 10 was set up to make one movie and one movie only. Once the movie Night of the Living Dead became successful, then we gave them a chance to vote to change that. And maybe come in with us on our next project. They unanimous, the shareholders unanimously voted not to make another movie. That left me and George in ownership of the script. So a couple of years later, I gave George the right to do Dawn of the Dead and call it a sequel, and he gave me the right to do Return of the Living Dead, but not to call it a sequel, which didn't much matter because one way or another, it's a sequel, you know, it's a spin-off of that same property. I tried, to some extent, to, look, we both own this thing, let's just partner up and do the next project together, but George, by that time, had partners that didn't want to share any credit, so it didn't, it didn't happen. So, eventually, uh, Return of the Living Dead got made, and did, the dead and day of the dead. I helped him get his whole deal through on Dawn of the Dead. I signed, signed whatever I needed to sign so he wouldn't lose his distribution deal. And then when Return of the Living Dead got financed and was about to come out, his partners tried to take my title away from me. Nice, nice turn of events. So I had to go before the MPA in New York City with. Ryan and Hemdale who were going to distribute return and the MPAA moved unanimously in my favor and so I kept the title. They were convinced their movie, by that time it was Day of the Dead, they were convinced their picture would be a hit and mine would be a flop and the reverse happened. <laughs> yeah, we, well, funny thing, we were in the, when, when the stage play, the only authorized stage play, uh, Night of the Living Dead Live premiered in Toronto. Russ and George and I were there to do a Q&A and <laughs> somebody said, is it true, is it true 
that there was an insurance policy that if you died of a stroke or a heart attack watching Night of the Living Dead, you got $50,000. And it, it was true, I answered the question, they took out a policy with Lloyds of London, and it's true. <laughs> and I said, and if you came back, you got 100000 <laughs> <laughs> And then somebody said, what do you think about these, uh, these, these, these breaking into people's skulls and eating brains and all that and fast zombies? And George said, oh, that's bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. How in the hell can they crack a skull open? And I said, come on, George. <laughs> you know, for Christ's sake. I mean, even in Dawn of the Dead, they reach into people's bodies and pull out organs. And I said, you know, by now, by now they've actually become almost supernatural. You know, whereas my idea was, because somebody said in the beginning when I started writing a script, they said, you know, well, how can we show people coming out of their graves and all that? We can't afford that. And I thought for a couple of minutes, I said, okay, so it's going to be the recently dead that can, that can come back. People from morgues and funeral homes or people, people killed or injured during this phenomenon. And those are the ones that can come back. But by now they are like supernatural. They're like monsters in a way that we never intended. Yeah. Like what's your what's your way of generating suspense as a filmmaker? My way of generating suspense. Mm -hmm. Well, you just gotta work with it. You know, I'm still getting published and I'm still making movies. And uh, I have 15 new novels. I, during COVID, I just kept writing. And uh, what else was I going to do? And so. Uh, you can go to wolfpackpublishing.com and one of the first novels that I wrote, and everything I write, pretty much I write as a screenplay and a novel. And so I wrote a screenplay called The Boy Who Hanged Rufus Buck and it's a Western horror story based on real events. And it got sold right away and the movie's done now. And Lionsgate picked it up, they're going to do theatrical distribution, and then Netflix. So, but it's a question of just of working with it, you know? You stare at that white page, and you keep thinking until the ideas start to come, and then you work with those ideas until they, until they start to mesh into a story. If you keep coming back to Okay, what happens next? Well, I have this character in the basement. He wants control, so he's gonna try to get that gun, you know? And you have, uh, so it's, the motivations come out of who the characters are and what their goals are. And if you keep coming back to that and asking yourself, question, well, if he tries to get that gun, then what's Ben going to do, you know? One of the best things about, like, for example, and I would say this in the few script discussions that we had where no, nobody was coming up with any ideas except me, and I would say, well, okay, there has to be an escape attempt because I can't just stay there or the movie's over. The escape attempt has to fail because if it succeeds, the movie's over. And so if it's going to fail, why would it fail? Well, this young guy might not be all that swift and he could, he could panic, especially since his girlfriend jumps in the truck with him. And what if he does something that causes the pump to catch on fire? And what if he tries to get out of there and the truck catches on fire? And if the truck blows up, then what's Harry Cooper going to do? He's up in the window throwing Molotov cocktails, but he's got a bird's eye view of this truck on fire, and then he sees it explode, and then he knows that to escape and tell him, what would he do? Well, he's established as somewhat of a blowhard and a coward, so he's probably going to run for the basement where he wanted to be all alone, right? It all makes sense logic and it all feeds off of who these characters are and what their motivations are. And then if he runs if he if he runs for the basement but he wants to protect himself so he slams 
He slams that door shut and locks it. And then Ben's trying to find his way back into the house. And now he finds the door locked and he has to get in. And what's he going to do if he sees that Harry locked him up? Well, naturally, he's going to kick Harry's ass. <laughs> and if he kicks Harry's ass, now Harry's even more pissed off than he was before and more determined to get control by getting that gun. You see what I mean? It just builds. It just If you use logic and you rely on the, on the characters and their, their true motivations and make them behave according to form, then the audience is going to be with you and they're going to buy into your story and stay with you, stay with your story. But if you throw a clinker in there that makes them stop believing in your characters or your story, then you've blown it. And we were very careful not to blow it. Now, somebody suggested that this wasn't my idea to bring the brother back because I intended that when he hit his head on a tombstone, he's done for. And somebody said, maybe the brother should come back and drag the sister out. And we carefully considered that. Would the audience buy it if his head hit this tombstone? And I thought, well, it could be. And we don't know, you know how badly in, injured these ghouls might be. Uh, perhaps the entire brain wasn't destroyed by a mere smash on the tombstone, maybe the audience would buy that he comes back. And we decided to go for it, and it became one of the iconic moments of the story. So, but we didn't just randomly do the stuff, it was all carefully considered. It's all the way, you know. Uh, what's the, uh, the question right here? Yeah, quick question. I just, I'm curious with it, the movie coming out in 1968, how is this a reflection of maybe the social commentary of what was going on with Vietnam, with the civil rights movement? We weren't, none of that was any of our thinking. Okay, okay. You know, we were very much against the war and we even, we even took part in film peace marches in Pittsburgh at that time. And so we were, we were very, uh, George and Russ and I are, are, are kind of consider ourselves renaissance men. We're interested in everything, socially, socially, politically, culturally, and so on. And most of our conversations in private were all of that sort. You know, artistic things, cultural things, and whatever. But in making that movie, we just wanted to make a good horror movie. And the sheriff is not a redneck. He's a guy doing a job. You know, if there were ghouls right now, people coming to life and devouring the living, people, there would have to be law enforcement people who went out and gunned them down and burned them. And that's what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. He's not doing it because he's a redneck. <laughs> you know, we made, we made no statement about race in that movie. I was well aware when I was working on the script that you know, we didn't know even if we could get the movie sold or if we would have to hand carry it from, from theater to theater because we knew nothing about distribution and whatever. And, 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 but I was well aware in the, in, the, in, the, in the racial climate of that time that when he slugs that white girl and walks around and carries her over to the couch and lays her down there and opens up her coat, I knew what kind of reaction that was going to get in the South. But we, we wanted to be iconoclastic because we wanted to get attention for our movie. Mr. Russo, again, thank you for a fantastic movie and all the things that you guys have created with this. I have grown up with this in my life. From a very young age, I was immediately taken in by horror movies and suspense and just the amazing acting and the amazing writing. My question, though, is, there was a trademark issue with the movie, from what I understand. And my question is, did that cost you, all of you, a lot of money? But at the same time, if it did cost you money, did it allow for a wired, wild or a larger distribution that people were able to see the movie and it was able to continue in a lot of other theaters, thus creating you know, the cult status and then front room status that the movie has? Well, Night of the Living Dead is, you know, <laughs> I mean, the, it's the greatest rip-off in movie history, absolutely. But as far as the trademark and all that, it is trademarked, the script's copyrighted, 
There's a new copyright on the new restoration. I don't like to talk about it a whole lot. Russ and I fought those battles for 50 years, and it's it's gut wrenching, and you know, it, it's just for legal reasons and every and emotional reasons, I don't want to talk about it. Sorry. All right. So my main question is. Um, during that time, no way knew exactly like what your version of a zombie is today. And, uh, you know, back then they would know a lot more about like the voodoo kind of zombie, the necromancy version of it. So uh, I guess my question is, how would you decide on the zombie lore of making it like afraid of fire? And if you get bitten, you get turned. And um, did that go into like try and create that suspense and making it a threat in your movie because I guess you want to believe that these zombies are an actual threat to keep that suspense going because like I don't want to be in the movie thinking like oh I could have just taken on these guys. That's a wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, was, he was asking uh, before the whole idea of zombies like the food, the Well, I went to see, we have three movie theaters in my small hometown, Clarendon, Pennsylvania. It's very close to Pittsburgh. And the movies changed twice a week, and I went to see just about every movie. And, but, the, and I often say that, you know, zombies weren't heavyweight fright material like, 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 like vampires or werewolves, especially vampires. And zombies, they just weren't scary. They shambled around, throw somebody against the wall, try to strangle somebody, and so on. I was never impressed with them. And, 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 um, and what, seemed, what seemed to do the trick was when we made them flesh eaters. And I think the reason is, you know, that human beings have been prey for all of our evolutionary history. We've had to be afraid of cave bears and saber two tigers and then on and on. The fear of being devoured is something, an atavistic fear that's in all of us. And then to make it worse, somebody you loved could be one of them and come back to you. And then you have to kill somebody you love or you could be bitten and turn into one of them. That a kind of, a kind of, you know, everlasting life that nobody wants. So all of those things taken together touch the nerve in people. And then it's just a well-crafted movie. <coughs> and it just, it just hooked people. And it continues to hook people. You know, whenever we go to college campuses sometimes and the kids will say, well, I don't want to see any lousy black and white movie and so on. They say that, but within the first few minutes, you can hear a pin drop and they're hooked. And the movie just has that power. So it is, I mean, it's a, it is a unique phenomenon. And one that doesn't die. That's pretty ironic. One of my best experiences I think I've ever had as being an independent filmmaker is I got to go to a wine bar with Johnny Russo and he's told me about some really intimate, great stories, not only about filmmaking, but just his life. And that was just such a treat because that's stuff you cannot get anywhere else. You cannot get that from DVD commentaries, from interviews. So that was a pleasure. I got to ask him all the questions that I have wanted to ask for years. This has been a film that has meant so much to me for years. So that was the big thing for me. And then of course, just being able to moderate a Q and A and hearing all the excellent questions that people had to ask. Like just knowing how much people still respond to this film is hugely rewarding for me. Uh, and I'm sure for John Russo, I mean, he, it's gotta be, it's gotta mean so much to him knowing that, you know, people are in their twenties, their thirties, going all the way to their seventies, eighties, like love this film. They still love it um, 55 years later. So it's just, it's a beautiful thing just to see and see him get his due, really. He's, a, he's such a pioneer of independent filmmaking. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> and my love will never die. Remember, Samantha.